Welcome back, everybody. I am so excited. This podcast is long overdue because we have been, you guys have been asking and asking for hormone info with breast cancer survivorship. And I listen and I hope to deliver. And I have a new friend on that I want you to meet. And her name is Dr. Kryn Men. And she is here to talk to us about all the things. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. You are, Dr. Corinne Men is a board-certified ob and a North American Menopause Society certified menopause practitioner. She has a special interest in areas often neglected in women's health, perimenopause and menopause, the unique needs of female cancer survivors and those at high risk for breast cancer. You are the perfect person to come on and talk about this. So thank you so much. Can you tell us your story about you were in training for ob and during your residency, you felt a breast lump and can you... Can you bring us to the to the now with your journey? Yeah, and, it, and, and, you and as you know, little. and as long as you want to take with that, just to, yeah. to let people know, like how you are the perfect person who knows all the data <laughs> and uh, cares deeply about this topic. So, in a nutshell, because because this could be really an entire podcast, my story because it's crazy. But when I was 28 years old, um, I was a second year OBGYN resident. Um, I was only married for about a year, um, and I felt a lump. It was 2001. Uh, in residency in New York City. Um, I uh, felt a lump. Um, my mom had just been diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer and um, she didn't have long to live. Uh, we had no family history of breast cancer We had or ovarian cancer. We had no risk factors. So my mom gets diagnosed. I'm very concerned. She's not going to last long. I feel this little lump and my fellow physicians, all female physicians in my residency, they're like, oh, Corinne, it's just a fibroadenoma. You're too young for breast cancer. You know, red flag number one. Okay. That's a big myth. No one's ever too young for breast cancer. So my mom subsequently dies about eight weeks later. And, you know, once I, you know, we kind of finished with that, I was like, hey, I should really get this little lump you know, checked out. And right before Christmas 2001, I was diagnosed with stage two ERPR positive breast cancer, HER2 negative for those who know what that is. Um, and subsequently underwent um, bilateral mastectomy, um, six months of chemotherapy. I did, um, we saved some embryos um, prior to chemotherapy. Um, subsequently after finishing um Chemo then went on um, ovarian suppression because that's what they did back then with Lupron and tamoxifen. And luckily, I had a really great healthcare team and we had really wanted to pursue pregnancy. So I did take a break from my endocrine therapy. I was able to get pregnant, no problems on my own. Um, and then after I delivered um, my daughter, who's now 18 years old, um, I went back on my tamoxifen, went back on Lupron, um, then subsequently made the decision that we were going to adopt and not have any further pregnancies. And so we adopted our little um, daughter, Lucia, who's 17 now from Guatemala. And when I came back with her, I said, you know what, even though I had been tested for the BRC gene and it was negative at the time, I'll update you on that. Um, I still felt something was not right. I was 28. My mom was 54 when she died. So I had my ovaries taken out. So lots of trauma and drama during all that time. But, uh, you know, the main thing was, was that while I did get excellent care in terms of my cancer, um, I, you know, experienced menopause three times, um, each one in a different way, you know, one from the chemotoxic um, effects of the uh, chemotherapy, um, then being on Lupram and then having my ovaries out. And each time it was worse and I had, was given no resources. I didn't know what to do. I was just busy being an OBGYN and then a new mom and my oncologist, my GYN, no, no one knew how to touch me in terms of helping me with those symptoms. So subsequently realized I need to help myself so I can help, help, well, certainly help myself, but also help my patients. And then found the North American Menopause Society, got educated. And, you know, luckily, because I was a physician, I was able to work with my oncologist because I could understand the data and get what I needed. But even for me, it took me years to adequately address my menopausal symptoms because I was a breast cancer survivor um, and because I had premature surgical menopause, which in and itself is a, you know, a a, a unique challenge. So that's kind of what led me <laughs> to tailor my practice and care about this and get really involved in, in my practice as well as with the Young Survival Coalition. 
which your listeners should know is the organization that is dedicated to women who are diagnosed under the age of 40 with breast cancer. Awesome. I'll put a link in there and make sure that that's in the show notes because you, because you didn't know about the Young Survival Coalition. You kind of found them and realized how important they were in supporting you on your journey. Yes, absolutely. They were, they were young back. This was 2001. They were only in New York City. They were only five years old. And the labor and delivery nurse um, who I worked with, her daughter um, had breast cancer young, um, was diagnosed during her pregnancy. And she was basically one of the founding members. And so it was only because of that connection. Because back then, you know, young survivors really, really were lost. Now there's more resources. Um, but the YSC is really, um, you know, kind of the premier organization. But even the YSC, I just I spoke in the fall to uh, at their annual summit and there was a room of about 400 survivors and me and a bunch of other, you know, physicians were discussing vaginal estrogen, for instance. And it was like their heads were exploding. No one had ever even talked to them about vaginal estrogen. And we're going to talk about systemic hormone therapy. But most survivors are not being offered that. So listen, most average women who don't have breast cancer aren't being offered appropriate treatment. So when you take the most vulnerable women, those are breast cancer survivors and those with surgical premature menopause, those women are really, really being mismanaged, undermanaged. And I think it's malpractice, frankly. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's exciting for me to be on this end of things, like where I, I got trained in the urology avenue, right? And so just to catch people up on like where I see breast cancer and hormones going, and then we'll back off a second, is I got trained that testosterone caused prostate cancer. If you got diagnosed with prostate cancer, never ever could you be on testosterone again. And now then it goes to, okay, well, once you've been treated and you're cured and it's been five years, you can get on testosterone if your testosterone is low. Now... In 2023, you come to me on testosterone, we diagnose you with prostate cancer, and a lot of, again, mild prostate cancer in men we don't even treat, we, we watch it, we keep you on your testosterone, and we don't even treat your prostate cancer. Now, I want to be clear and say prostate cancer is not breast cancer, but the paradigm of hormones causing these cancers has changed in prostate cancer to the point where these people can be on their testosterone, and I think it's coming with breast cancer. And I think it's coming from the physicians. It's coming from Dr. Avram Blooming, who saw his wife go through menopause after breast cancer, saw the need, put her on hormones, helped support her to get on hormones. And then people like you who say, I've been through the training. I understand the oncology. I understand the risk of having low hormones and I'm choosing to be on hormones. So just to catch us up, are you currently on systemic hormone therapy? I am, but after many years of not being on hormone therapy, you know, and I think the important thing is I treated my primary breast cancer, as you alluded to with your testosterone patient, your, your testosterone, your prostate cancer patients. So I treated my primary breast cancer. No one managed my menopausal symptoms then. And there are, are things you can do that are not menopausal hormone therapy related to help. Right. And then I went many years with really suffering. And finally, someone was like, you should be on Effexor. So I was on Effexor, fine. That was not enough. And it was only in recent years, and I will have to shout out to Avram because he's really like a true mentor. And I think he's, the work he's done with his book, Estrogen Matters, has, you know, categorically changed my life personally, because I feel so secure and confident in the research because of the way he explains it and leads. Um, that I have in conjunction with um, my oncologist decided that low dose estradiol patch and some progesterone at night and when I and vaginal estrogen, of course, it's changed my life. Yeah, it's changed my life. Um, so I'm, at, I'm at what point at what point did you realize the benefits outweighed the risks of taking hormones? I mean, I knew it for a long time intellectually but the trauma around being a breast cancer survivor and the fear of recurrence always prevented me from going taking the next step right um and it wasn't until the last couple of years where I really just did a lot of introspection and said like listen I need to <laughs> I need to take the advice that I dish out and and I was like you know what it's time um so so yeah so it, it took a long time, though. Awesome. Well, did your oncologist kind of go through that that 
education with you? Like, were they at first like, no way, Jose? And now they're like, she wants it, I approve? Or like, how did their thinking on it have to change? So, you know, I've been lucky and I think it's because I'm a doctor and because I'm a squeaky wheel type of person. So all along the way, I always, you know, had a really, you know, good working relationship. So like, for instance, with my, um, my initial oncologist, you know, they worked with me with pregnancy, right? And they didn't say no, right? And then that was, remember, I'm 22 years survivor. So that was a long time ago. 22 years ago, the data was less clear. The data is really clear now right. that we can pursue a pregnancy. Um, but then when I, I went, then I switched on colleges once I, I moved up, you know, in the suburbs and I had someone follow me for my kind of survivorship times. Um, he was always actually supportive of having a discussion with me. And I think I didn't push it until I educated myself really further. And once I did, and I was like, Hey, middleman, look at this. And he was like, yeah, Karen, go ahead. <laughs> Fair. I mean, when you but come when people, you come in with yeah the education and the data and the papers, but most people don't get that. In fact, they get so it, like literally the polar opposite to the point of like if you think there's like gaslighting in general women's health or general menopause care, the guilt, the the gaslighting, the actual just like really, I mean, it's just unbelievable the comments I hear all the time from breast cancer survivors on the conversations they have with their oncologists. It's and their GYNs. It's it's actually it's awful. Like what are, you should what are be saying? Lucky. Um, really, how dare you ask this? You should be lucky you're alive. Like, why would you ever take that risk? Or um, anything about sexual dysfunction, like really that's what you're worried about. Um, and, and, and just like, no, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's unsafe and literally just wrong, wrong information. Understanding that when we talk about local vaginal hormones, they're not systemic and breast cancer survivors can use them. That's a very clear cut and easy thing that they should be able to speak to their patients about. But women get, I mean, just you know, comments like, vaginal estrogen causes breast cancer vaginal estrogen will increase your risk you can't use it and they write in the charts patients say dr mendy I, I log into my patient portal and it says patient you know you know um requesting vaginal estrogen has been warned that it, it could increase her you know this whole litany of things that are just not even true um and it, i don't know what that comes from maybe it's a medical malpractice thing but it's just cruel to like you know kind of keep on you know, instilling these, these incorrect notions and fear and saying, it's on you. If your breast cancer comes back, I warned you, you know, that's not really appropriate <laughs> at all. So yeah. it's, it's pretty, it's pretty grim out there for the breast cancer survivor. And the thing is there are like clear guidelines for vaginal estrogen. Obviously we're going to talk about systemic estrogen for menopause, but even those guidelines for vaginal estrogen, I find they're not being followed. I see women at like des NCI designated cancer centers at the top academic centers in New York city area who come to me and I'm like, you're being seen at Sloan Kettering cancer center and your oncologists are telling you these things. I'm like, this is crazy, you know? And it's hard because who, why should they believe me <laughs> when everybody out there is telling them, you know, something else. So there's a lot, you know, I have to spend a lot of time kind of convincing and educating them. And it's not an easy thing when all they're hearing are these negative ideas, you know? Yeah. Back up for one second. Just tell us your, your view, your opinion. Why are doctors and patients so afraid of hormones in the first place? Cause I, I'll ask my patients, I'll be like, why are you so afraid? And they can't even tell me why they're afraid. They just are. Well, they're afraid because of breast cancer. Yes. And what are their main concerns? Breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer. Whether it's of someone who doesn't have breast cancer, they're afraid it's going to cause breast cancer. And someone who does have breast cancer, they think even local vaginal estrogen is going to cause it. And then certainly the breast cancer survivor who's looking for systemic hormone therapy, they think it's an absolute contraindication because everywhere they look, it's published as a absolute contraindication. But in medicine, there are no absolutes. There's risks and benefits. And, you know, the oncologists are really good at discussing risks and benefits. They do it all the time. I sat there and they told me, here's the risk and benefits from doing this different chemotherapies, the different regimens, you know, the different endocrine um, adjuvant therapies, the surgeries, lumpectomy. So, like, this is not a new concept of risk versus benefit. But for some reason, when it comes to women suffering from menopause or from sexual pain, 
that risk benefit conversation seems like it's not important anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. just I think it's misogyny, and I also think it's it's medical malpractice fears. You know, OBGYNs live in a really you know, high medical malpractice, you know, world. And so the knee jerk reaction is to avoid anything that is deemed risky, even if it's not risky. And it's the time people just, they don't want to have the time to counsel a regular woman, much less once you come into the GYN's office and you had a history of breast cancer, you're like, Ooh, I don't know what to do with you. And then you go to the oncologist and they're like, Ooh, I only save your life. I don't really help with like sex and hot flashes. Like go right. talk to your GYN. And then the GYN's like, and then you're like, Oh, well, I, I have nowhere to go. And so then they suffer in silence. It's really sad. Totally. I had a, I had a oncology nurse come up to me years ago now, and she enlightened me to the divorce rate that happens after the diagnosis of breast cancer. I had no idea. And and her thought is like, you're disrupting the family life. You're disrupting her intimacy. You're disrupting, you know, the, now, now I'm somebody to be, to be taken care of instead of just a spouse. And she's like the lack of vaginal estrogen, the pelvic pain that they go through because of the estrogen blockers. And it really blew my mind open to like, we're disrupting her entire life by not helping her treat her symptoms. No, we're hitting their breast cancer with a hammer. And great. I'm so glad we've got amazing treatments. We're extending the lives of women with advanced breast cancer. We are curing millions of women. The treatments are evolving. It's so exciting. And so I'm so happy that we have that, but we're completely ignoring everything else. And the reality is, is that breast cancer survivors are not being informed of the bigger picture. You're more than just your breast cancer. Most breast cancer survivors are gonna die of heart disease. Um, They're at risk because of their, many have premature menopause, premature surgical menopause, at risk of osteoporosis, hip fractures. More women die every year of hip fractures than they die of breast cancer. Way more women die of heart disease than their breast cancer. Um, Mm -hmm. Dementia, and then all of the relationship issues. That happened. I'm lucky. I'm I'm married to my college sweetheart. He's my true friend and partner, and he was with me every step of the way. But let me tell you, he's a patient and loving man who really, you know, had to deal with a lot. I was a young, you know, newly married young woman who hadn't, we hadn't had babies yet. And, you know, I'm dealing with all this premature menopause and severe vaginal dryness and libido changes, and I couldn't sleep and the depression and anxiety that I never realized was from menopause. I thought it was chemo brain. I thought it, they're like, oh, it's just chemo brain. And maybe it was, or it's just a side effect of chemotherapy or it's a side effect of this. But in the end, now I've learned, no, no, all of that was probably mm-hmm. 80% or more the severe surgical and chemotoxic menopause. That's yeah. I, I think one of the most and, damaging things that we did was we told women that something their body naturally produces gives them cancer and tries to kill them. Like the, the myth of estrogen causing breast cancer, like, let's break it down for a second. Why is most breast cancer diagnosed when women are postmenopausal, when they have no estrogen in their body? And number two, you're really, really high estrogen is when you're pregnant, right? And you don't have a higher risk of breast yeah. cancer when you're pregnant. And, and we let breast cancer survivors get pregnant. So we're putting them up at a high estrogen. All of these things point to me. It like pokes holes in this myth that estrogen causes cancer. Do you elaborate as you, as you'd like on that. Yeah. I mean, those are two excellent points. And I think that, you know, it's kind of silly that it's like, you know, we're doctors. Okay. We should be able to be nuanced about how we explain a disease process to someone. And just like heart disease has many factors that go into it. So does cancer. And this idea that it's black and white, estrogen causes cancer, estrogen is bad. It's it's just categorically, it's wrong. And to say that to somebody is ignorant. And if you're a physician saying that, then it's just wrong, you know? Um, so we know that estrogen doesn't cause cancer because for God's sakes, our bodies you know, evolution didn't design us to produce something toxic every month, right? You know, Mm -hmm. that's one thing. And we have so much data about pregnancy and that multiple pregnancies in your life, you know, um, breastfeeding and pregnancy um, and pregnancy at an early age. I think the um, Avrin talks about it in his book that um, 
women who have a pregnancy under the age of 20, not that we're recommending that, but let's just talk about it, has, have a 70% decreased risk of ever getting breast cancer, okay? Um, and you know, and back in the decades before, in the 70s and even the 80s, they used high doses of estrogen and progesterone to treat metastatic and advanced breast cancer. And in fact, high doses of, I believe it was progesterone, um, but certainly estrogen, um, was compared to tamoxifen, and it was actually better than tamoxifen, but the side effects were intolerable, so they went with tamoxifen. Um, so, and then certainly, you know, the, the pregnancy data, we know that it's safe, and that really interesting that recently in December, San Antonio um, Breast Cancer Conference, they kind of released the results of the positive trial, and the positive trial basically um, confirmed the data that we had known for a while that women can take a pause in their endocrine therapy, their tamoxifen and their romantase inhibitor. It's exactly what I did. I was the positive trial 22 years ago when I got pregnant. I took a pause. I got pregnant, had crazy high estrogen levels, <laughs> you know, had my baby, went back on to my, my tamoxifen. And when I went back on to my tamoxifen, they decided, okay, this time, Corinne, we don't have to use Lupron because that's an outdated approach. So this is another study that your listeners should know about. So it's called, I think it was called the SOFT trial. And they were looking at in breast cancer survivors who um, were premenopausal, who were taking tamoxifen. So this is really, really interesting, right? So you're premenopausal, you're having, you know, your monthly cycles. You have a lot of estrogen being produced, a ton. And the question was, should those women who are still premenopausal on tamoxifen, should we suppress their hormones? Should we give them Lupron or, you know, estrogen blockers to, you know, shut down their ovaries? And so they looked at it and there was no benefit. And so we've abandoned that because that was like an extreme form of just putting all of these women on tamoxifen into menopause. And there was no benefit there. Um, so that tells us a lot. And it, that right there, that one fact, you, people have to let that sink in. All these women out there are on tamoxifen with normal, they're still getting their periods. They have estrogen, right? They finish their tamoxifen. They go through menopause and suddenly they are asking for like a, like a spit of estrogen, a little tiny transdermal patch and a little bit of progesterone, far less than what their ovaries were producing for all those years, right? And they're told absolutely no. It makes no sense, you know? Um, and I also like to point this out, tamoxifen is a, is a cousin of Clomid. When, before I started my chemotherapy, um, I was seen, um, by Dr. Octe at Cornell, um, and he was a leading researcher in, um, preserving fertility in cancer, um, patients undergoing chemotherapy. And he used tamoxifen in me, higher doses of it to stimulate my ovaries to produce eggs because it's a cousin of Clomid and I harvested a whole bunch of eggs that I wound up not needing, but we froze them just in case. But when I did that, I did that before my chemotherapy, my, that tamoxifen raised my estrogen levels five times higher than they normally would be. So, it, you know, tamoxifen, there's this idea that tamoxifen puts you into menopause and you're going to be in menopause if you go on tamoxifen. It's just not true. That's not what happens with tamoxifen. Tamoxifen blocks estrogen receptors on circulating breast cancer cells, but it actually raises your circulating levels of estrogen. So the, and again, Avram talks about this in his book that, you know, the founder, or, you know, the, the, the grandfather basically of tamoxifen, Craig Jordan, basically said that women who are on tamoxifen and premenopausal have very high levels of estrogen yet the tamoxifen has a clear anti-tumor effect. So tamoxifen is working in lots of ways. It's not an estrogen blocker per se, but I think that the general public thinks of it like that. So they're like, oh, I'm on tamoxifen, block estrogen, estrogen must be bad. Mm -hmm. But it's way more nuanced than that. In fact, they've, they, we, we know that tamoxifen works in all kinds of ways and there's like a direct anti-tumor effect that basically doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's working on the estrogen receptors. And so what Craig Jordan said was that like, yeah, well, so when women go through menopause and they're on tamoxifen or they're a menopausal woman who's starting tamoxifen, adding in a little bit of, you know, estrogen 
is of no consequence, you know, because we know it works in women who have very high estrogen levels. So I think that's, I think allowing pregnancy after breast cancer and the soft trial and this like kind of this understanding of tamoxifen, these are all things that point to the nuances of estrogen in breast cancer. And it's more this idea of changing the environment that the breast cancer cell is growing in at the time of diagnosis. You know, it's changing things up by giving chemo, obviously surgery, different, you know, medications, Herceptin now, sometimes Tamoxifen and AI, but it's not just, you've got to remove all of estrogen. So, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not so simple. Can we talk about the breast cancer nomenclature? So, so many of my patients, they come in and they say, my breast cancer was estrogen positive. My breast cancer was estrogen positive. And I think they take that to mean that estrogen caused their breast cancer. Can you explain that better? Because my understanding is it means it's a well-differentiated cancer that still has estrogen receptors on it like breast tissue does. Actually can be a good sign compared to if you're estrogen negative. It doesn't mean that estrogen caused your cancer. Am I understanding that properly? Yes. And I think that's an excellent, I never actually even thought about that. That's one of the reasons why women think that, but you're absolutely right. So, you know, there's some basic kind of markers or, you know, you know, things that we can look at on a breast cancer cell, like, you know, does it express receptors for estrogen or progesterone or does it not? So it's either estrogen receptor positive. It's not estrogen positive. It's estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive, or we call it, you know, est- you know, hormone receptor negative. And then we also look at the HER2 nu, if it overexpresses the HER2 nu gene. Um, so HER2 positive. So, you know, by, by those, those are like the very big general classification. So you could be a triple positive patient. So ER, PR positive with the HER2 positive, or you could be triple negative, or you could be a combination. Um, and you're, you're right. What the study shows is that ER, PR positive breast cancers in general, this is like a, you know, a, a big, a broad generalization, generally are less aggressive, can be um, more, they look more similar to a regular breast cell. They haven't gone down that whole road of looking very poorly differentiated. You could have, listen, my ERPR positive breast cancer cells were very poorly differentiated. I had other markers that made my cancer more um, risky. I had lymph node involvement. I had lymphovascular invasion. Um, I mentioned some of these things because women have to understand your breast cancer is like your fingerprint. It's individual and it's unique to you and you can't compare it to anybody else. Um, And to simplify it and to say that, I always hear this, estrogen feeds my breast cancer. People say that all the time. I'm like, does it? I think you're, it's an oversimplification that probably comes from exactly what you pointed out. Yeah. Yeah. I think oncologists don't, they don't explain this though. They don't don't talk to people about this. They just, yeah. No, I mean, to me, I'm like, if you're estrogen, it's because people say I'm estrogen positive breast cancer. They don't say estrogen receptor positive. They don't know that that means like, Hey, you're, it's, it's not different it's maybe not an aggressive form because it still kind of looks like a breast cell, which has receptors, right? Like they don't understand all of that, but it does not mean that estrogen caused your breast cancer. No, no. Estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer in a normal, you know, average woman. Now, if you, the, the reality is people who have, so uh, this is a very interesting, Dr. Jim Simon, who is, a doctor who's very involved in NAMS and Ishwish, and he's a really, he's an amazing thought leader and also also a mentor towards, to me, when thinking of these things. And, you know, we talk about this idea of your lifetime exposure to estrogen and the risk, subsequent risk of breast cancer. And so that's another reason why women get really scared about hormone therapy. Like, why would I give my body more estrogen? But again, this is an oversimplified idea. You're, when they're talking about your lifetime exposure of to estrogen, they're really talking about like big things, right? Like, like having like for instance, if you have many years where you don't ovulate, PCOS, you have lots of estrogen being put out in your body, right? And you're not always ovulating. Low levels of progesterone. You might be obese. When you're obese, you have more circulating of estrogen. You know, you never breastfed. So during breastfeeding, you're times your estradiol levels are actually low. Those are big, big shifts. 
in how much estrogen your breast cells were exposed to over many, many years, having your periods really early or having, you know, menopause really late. That is not the same amount of, that's huge amounts of estrogen over many, many years of having a little bit of low dose estrogen therapy to relieve symptoms. It's like, it's like, you know, it's a teardrop when you're talking about an ocean, you know? And so that's, that's another thing I think that people really confuse because like the Gale risk model, when they're looking at the risk of breast cancer, takes into account, you know, your lifetime exposure to estrogens. Um, so I think that's another kind of idea out there that gets people really scared and confuses them. I'm waiting to hear, and I, tell me what you know more than me, because let's agree that estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer. We got to get people there. But we keep hearing over and over that being overweight increases our risk because it increases one's estrogen levels. My question is, do we have data? And is there something unique about the estrogen that's being made by the adipose tissue that explains why these women with more adipose tissue have a higher rate? Or is it just the inflammation that comes from having more adipose tissue? Or is it like the flavor of estrogen is different than the flavor that's made from ovaries and adrenals versus adipose fat? Because I keep hearing over and over that it's the estrogen made by the fat that causes the breast cancer. And I'm like, I don't think it's that straightforward. Your, well, of, course your thoughts? That, of course it's not that straightforward. A woman who is obese and has, you know, other, you know, often it goes hand in hand with other things, right? They might also be pre-diabetic or have diabetes. They may have hypertension. They may have high lipids. We know the importance of inflammation on immune processes and, you know, how, you know, you metabolize things, you know, your gut health, um, how you metabolize your own hormones. Um, so, and yes, the, the estrogens that are being released from your fat cells, um, you know, is estrone, it's a, it's a different kind of, you know, estrogen. There's lots of things to that, you know, go into that increased risk and just say just it's, oh, they're heavier, they have higher levels of estrogen. Not necessarily. They don't, you, you start like drawing, you don't, you don't go around drawing blood tests on obese patients and, oh, you have very high levels of estrogen. No, it's a lot more nuanced. And I think that because no one cares about the suffering of, of women. I mean, that's, that's just like an overarching thing. Like women's suffering is kind of put to the wayside where, you know, men's suffering is considered a little bit more important in society in general, that it's just easy to just write things off and say, yeah, no, you know? So I think, yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that the obesity and elevated estrogen levels is some kind of, you know, slam dunk link there. It's a lot more nuanced. Yeah, it's a lot more nuanced. Um, so, you know, what I see again and again on Instagram is somewhere between there's somewhere between three and five million breast cancer survivors. This is a big population. Cure rates are very high. Number one cause of death amongst the survivors is heart disease, which we know estrogen can be protective against. And so what, what I keep saying is because people are like, can I go on hormones? Can I go on hormones? And, you know, we keep saying there's not enough data. There's not enough data. And I pulled this from Dr. Blooming, his, he, he uh, wrote this, and I just, I, I'm sorry, but I need to read all of this because like yeah. people need to hear it and then I want your spin on it. Yeah. So he, he wrote, his, the title of this is The Safety of Systemic Hormone Replacement Therapy in Breast Cancer Survivors. The article was in Breast Cancer Research and Treatment, January 2022, Dr. Avram Blooming. And here we go. This, so this is against the we don't have enough studies, right? Because the question is, when is enough studies enough? 25 studies of HRT after a breast cancer diagnosis published between 1980 and 2013 are discussed, as are the 20 reviews of those studies published between 1994 and 2021. Only one of the 25 studies, the HABITS trial, demonstrated an increased risk of recurrence, which was limited to local or contralateral and not distant recurrence. None of the studies, including HABITS, reported increased breast cancer mortality associated with HRT. Even in the HABITS trial, the absolute increase in the number of women who had a recurrence, localized only, associated with HRT administration was 22. It is on the basis of these 22 patients with HRT, with its demonstrated benefits for so many aspects of women's health, that is being denied to millions of breast cancer survivors around the world. Yeah, I mean, that is the most important statement. Boom, mic drop, slam dunk. It's, you know, and if anyone really, and I'm sure you've told your listen, 
listeners this before, you know, Avram's got a whole chapter of this where he really kind of in a really great way lays out all of those studies. And we can link that. Um, he, he wrote a review article in the Cancer Journal last May um, that summarized it really nicely. And it's not a very long article. Anybody could read it. Um, and it's one of my tools that I use when discussing it, you know, with patients. But here's this idea that there's over 25 studies. OK, one, we've got lots of, you know, other kind of, I'd say, like associated or, you know, data that we've already mentioned, whether it's issues about pregnancy, how tamoxifen works, you know, um, you know, other things like that, uh, the soft trial, the positive trial. So taken into whole, the preponderance of evidence, right, you know, is in favor that we can use in selected patients after they have their primary treatment, understand this, you have to be treated for your breast cancer. You should be um, offered vaginal estrogen at any time. Um, and then you should also be offered, you know, if you're, if you're taking um, therapy that is, you know, is contraindicated at the moment to taking hormone therapy, then that's fine. You should be offered other things, you know, to help with any kind of menopausal symptoms. But once you're almost done with your therapy, you should, in ideal worlds, have a conversation with your oncologist and or your menopause specialist or your GYN who should be knowledgeable on this. It's, 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 it's not defensible that they're not. And you should be offered your risks and benefits because what are we doing? We're leaving generations of millions of women, survivors of breast cancer, and we're leaving them with all of these other you know, health issues of premature menopause and menopause, and no one's addressing that. And even giving them an option to know, hey, you've got these increased risks, heart disease, osteoporosis, dementia, sexual dysfunction. You know, you should know that there is over 25 studies plus all this other associated evidence. But instead, they're not even offered that. Even to, they're told, no, gatekeeping. And then when they push it, they're labeled a difficult patient. She's, you know, whatever. She's trying to, you know, she's, they, they write in the chart, she's doing something that may cause her breast cancer to come back. So that's the state we're living in. But women need to understand there is data. To say that there's no data is, is wrong. And the HABITS trial, so this is really interesting. The HABITS trial is the only one that showed an increased risk. And Patients really under, need to understand the huge problems with the HABITS trial. Yes, it was a randomized controlled study, but women need to understand in the one study that showed an increased risk, in this study, the, the risk, the recurrence was shown to be just in the first two years in either the same site of their breast where their breast cancer, you know, was, um, or in the other side of the breast, okay? But what they didn't do they didn't do mammograms on anyone entering the study. And the recurrence came in the first two years. So we know if you're going to have a local recurrence because some cells are left over, you're going to have it in the first two years. They didn't check any of these women, which is crazy. And many people think it should, it's actually, it avoids it because it, you, you can't, you can't really counsel patients if, because that, that, that really was a huge issue. And they didn't, when they randomized the groups between those taking hormone therapy and those not, they didn't include their receptor status, their HER2 status, or their lymph node status. And they left it up to the individual provider to decide whether they got hormone therapy or not. So what happened when you actually look at the data, some women in the no therapy group actually got hormone therapy, and some women in the hormone therapy group did not have hormone therapy. So there's so many confounding factors. So you got this one study. Yes, it's randomized controlled. It's got a lot of problems. You got 25 other studies plus, I don't know, I think 20 other um, review studies that have kind of rehashed and looked at the data. And all of them are on one side. And we've got this one over here and a lot of knee-jerk fears. And that's basically what's driving the discussion. I mean, how unscientific is that? Yeah, totally. I have a friend who's an OB-GYN and her theory is this fear of breast cancer. 
like, yeah, but breast cancer, yeah, but breast cancer, like you are just your breasts. You're not a human otherwise with other body parts or competing interests for death and, you know, discomfort in her opinion on it. Cause I'm like, why are we so obsessed with breast cancer when we know we cure it really well and they end up dying of heart disease, which we're completely ignoring. Why are we so obsessed? Her opinion is it's the patriarchy keeping us silent by scaring us with breasts. Is that too far fetched? Because once we understand this, like it gets a little ridiculous of like, why are we scaring women so much about breast cancer? I mean, I think that, listen, you know, there's implicit bias in the world. There's factors that, you know, doctors practice under that they are not even aware is influencing them. Um, and so there's societal attitudes about what is considered worthy to treat, you know, um, and being female really puts you at risk of not having your, you know, symptoms. We, we know there's just tons of data on this, you know, so yeah, I, I, I believe, I mean, that's a real, that's, that's an extreme view, but I think there's a lot of merit to that view because if men, if men were being castrated, and not offer testosterone, they'd be up in arms. There'd be a war or it would never, it just would never happen. You know, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer and he's fine. This was a few years ago. And I went to his, one of his first appointments with him, you know, just as his like doctor daughter, you know, and I was astounded because the whole conversation was all about maintaining his sexual health and how, you know, what would happen. And I was like, oh my God, I was like, no one ever did this with me. None of my breast cancer patients or survivor patients ever get counseled on this. And it was, it was eye opening because as an OBGYN, I only see women, you know, so I love to hear your comments on the whole, you know, but I saw that from my, I was like, wow, they're really prioritizing this, like, 70 year old man's sex life, you know, but they could care less about me at 28, newly married, you know? Yeah. Um, I had to fight the other day for a patient who has got metastatic breast cancer controlled. It's actually, she's no, no evidence of disease right now. So she's doing well in her therapy and she's getting married. She's going on her honeymoon and she can't have sex. The oncologist in the GYN, and this is in Westchester County, New York, access to like the best hospitals in New York city. No one would prescribe her vaginal estrogen. Imagine if a newly diagnosed or, you know, a man who, you know, was about to get married and go off on his honeymoon. He says, I can't maintain an erection. Imagine them denying that to him. Just wouldn't happen. Would not happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only reason this woman prescribed vaginal estrogen is because like the nurse in the office kind of knew me and she called me and the patient. And then I had to make a bunch of phone calls and jump over all these hoops. And then I was like, yeah, yeah. I'll write her for vaginal estrogen. They're like, oh, okay, as long as you do it, Dr. Men. I'm like, did you guys not go to medical school? Like, are you really that afraid? Are you that lame? It's yeah, pathetic. Totally. Let's talk about who breast cancer patient did their treatment. Who is the best? And again, going back to what you said, everybody's got a different flavor and different everything. But who is a great candidate for my breast cancer was a long time ago, or I'm really having symptoms? Like, who is a, a shoe in for you to be like, give this woman hormones? Well, I think the very first thing is your symptoms, right? I think if you are symptomatic and it's affecting the quality of your life, then we should break down those symptoms and we should address them. I like to separate the ones out that we can treat with vaginal hormones and then the symptoms that we can treat um, only with systemic hormone therapy. That's one. Number two, so if you're very symptomatic and it's affecting the quality of your life, that you, you raise really high up there. For, then the next thing is just a lot of education and understanding that there's 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 no, no promises in life. Nothing is 100%. And we do not have definitive data guaranteeing that there is no risk that me giving you menopausal hormone therapy is going to make your breast cancer come back. But so that could be said for her breast cancer treatment or anything else, whether she takes statins or any other medication, right? So once, you know, so as, so I say to women, if you are so risk adverse, if you are going to be so sick to your stomach and nervous and upset about taking hormone therapy because you just can't get out of your mind, you know, 
that there is an unknown because we don't have perfect studies, then maybe you're not a good candidate and maybe we'll start with vaginal estrogen and we'll do non-hormonal things. But what I find is even if they are in that category to begin with, like a lot of fear, you know, it may take a couple of consults and a lot of homework that I assign them um, <laughs> to read and think about that I can bring them back. So that's normally not a contraindication, but it's a factor. Like if the fear is too much, I can't push that on you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, after that, I think that most women are really good candidates. I think, you know, the other thing is very important is to take into an account, not just your symptoms, but your risk factors for chronic disease, right? So like if I have a breast cancer survivor who was also really high risk for cardiac disease, diabetes, dementia, you know, um, we are actually hurting her more by denying her hormones than, you know, than anything. And so to me, that's a real failure, I think, you know, in the system, if you are an oncologist and you really care about that patient living long term, you're going to care about everything. And if you are so tunnel vision on this breast cancer theoretical recurrence risk down the road, which if it recurs, it's probably going to occur because it was going to occur. Not because anyone's giving you a tiny bit of hormone therapy to relieve severe symptoms. You know, um, I think they're missing the big picture and they're actually not treating their disease because tr treating their disease is also dealing with the serious toxic collateral gender treatments. Um, so, you know, I think when women have all of that education, I think most women are, most breast cancer survivors can be very, very good um, candidates. I don't think there's any one person who would be a bad candidate. Now, obviously, the, you know, you have low risk disease, you've, you know, had your breasts removed, you, um, you know, have gone many years without a recurrence, you know, your initial markers were all very favorable versus someone who had 20 positive lymph nodes, um, you know, a very large mass, um, you know, obviously you have to, you know, take those things into consideration. Um, but if we take the premise that it doesn't cause recurrence, it shouldn't matter, frankly, what stage their disease was, you know? Good point. So for, I have... I have a, a, a dear young breast cancer survivor friend um, who was diagnosed. Um, she felt the lump a week before her wedding and her GYN actually didn't biopsy until after the honeymoon. The GYN suspected she kind of knew it was probably breast cancer, but she's like, I don't want to destroy this girl's like marriage. So she went off, get married. She comes back. Go, you know, she had pretty advanced disease and, you know, she went through her primary treatment. She actually was allowed. I, I hate when people say this allowed, like, oncologists allow you to do things allowed to get um pregnant and has a healthy i think he's like seven years old now but guess what she has such severe chronic pelvic pain because she's on an ai an aromatase inhibitor and no one for all these years would give her vaginal estrogen even though they allowed her to get pregnant it is so impacting her life that she says it's been four or five years with no sex and any attempted sex um, ends in tears. Their relationship is on the brinks. And she was then referred off for vaginal laser therapy, which caused the entire right side of her labia to basically melt because it was so poorly estrogenized, it couldn't respond very well to the laser therapy. And now she has chronic pelvic syndrome with, you know, vaginismus and chronic pelvic pain and trigger points and all of this. And I'm like, this is so crazy like how is that even acceptable and and she's still really battling getting access to even vaginal estrogen and she's going to finish her ai in i think she's got another year left of it and even in her case i've already kind of prepping her like we're going to have that conversation and i've sent her to dr rachel rubin rachel's going to be taking care of her she's going to dc so i She'll eventually get there, but this idea that she had to get there is so so needless. It's, it's yeah. It's, and these stories are constant. I get them every, every day of the week. Yeah, yeah, totally. So do I. Um, do you think it's like a whole nother podcast? Do you think that we are 
and again, this is your own opinion and, you know, everybody, we're not, we're not your medical doctors. This is kind of our opinion. But what I see is like everybody gets an aromatase inhibitor for as long as humanly possible. Do you think the pendulum's going to swing on that? Do you think we're going to say, hey, we're over treating and we need to not AI everybody? Yes, this, this in particular drives me crazy. You know, so yes, there is an incremental benefit of being in an AI over tamoxifen, at least for a couple of years, but with this, with this like purest idea that it should be 10 years of AI, right? And, you know, I, I'm always counseling patients, you need to go back to your oncologist and you really, really need to understand the incremental benefit that you're getting from that in terms of reducing your risk versus the huge collateral damage. I don't think that anybody is taking it seriously. And unless unless you've gone through ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor, you have no idea how awful it is. It is, and so I hope the pendulum swinging. I think a good oncologist is more nuanced, and the you know. So I've seen where they're like, yeah, let's let's switch you to tamoxifen, or <clears throat> let's maybe decrease the number of years, you know. Um, but there's a lot of places that it's very black and white, and and women don't even they don't even know that it's an option for them, you know. Mm-hmm. And like, I was the opposite. <laughs> my, my oncologist, I did fine on tamoxifen. Tamoxifen never caused me any problems, um, whether I was still getting my periods and premenopausal or the times <clears throat> when I was, you know, had ovarian suppression or my ovaries were taken out. My side effects were from my low estrogen levels. It was not from the tamoxifen. I was kind of the opposite. Um, my oncologist was really collaborative and we decided because I had taken breaks on tamoxifen off of tamoxifen to get pregnant um i i went through a little period of time where i was being a quote unquote bad patient and was sick of the ovarian suppression and i was like middleman i'm going off this and i was like off it for eight months so i had a couple times where i took a break because i was like and in retrospect it wasn't from the tamoxifen it was from the untreated menopause that we decided that i was going to be on tamoxifen for longer and i was on it probably if you add up all the years almost almost 20 years on and off because he was like, Corinne, you were diagnosed really young. We're thinking outside of the box. You had lymphovascular invasion. You got, you know, you had some risk factors for like distant recurrence because, you know, ER positive breast cancers, although they're considered less aggressive, if you look at over time, there is a slow tick up in their recurrence risk. Um, Even at, you know, you know, 20 years, Olivia Newton-John is an example. She died after a recurrence many, many years later. So that was always a fear in the back of my mind. But, you know, I think that there needs to be an art to managing these endocrine, you know, drugs like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor. And it's not a one size fits all. And women deserve to have the discussion and not be labeled a difficult patient. So when I see women who refuse an AI or refuse tamoxifen, they get like labels in their chart and then they wind up many times they're the doctor's not working with them, you know, on their options. And I think a lot of people are being overtreated, just like a lot of people were overtreated with radical mastectomies back in the day. Mm-hmm. The pendulum swung, lumpectomy is okay, you know. Um, hopefully it will become a little bit more nuanced because there's massive amounts of women suffering. Uh, and I think sometimes with very little return on the benefit. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really refreshing to hear that because it's, you know, it's just what I see. I'm like, oh, my gosh, all these stage ones, you know, being on AIs for five years, five plus years. And I'm like, is it? And again, I come from the prostate cancer world. We used to take out your testicles, radiate you, remove your prostate and put you on Lupron. And now we're like, <clears throat> let's just watch some of this. And here's some testosterone. Like, it's like what we've done in changing that in the last 10 years is crazy. And I'm like, breast cancer needs that also. If if only we can get away from this, like, kill every breast cancer cell for as long as humanly possible and don't care about the human suffering that happens. A, 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 the law of diminishing returns at some point, I think, is, is yeah, where we're headed with this. Yeah, yeah, um, so- absolutely. So tell people where they can find you. I know you see lots of telemed. You're also active in Alloy. Um, if they want to see you on Alloy or your own telemed, where can they find you? Because they're all going to find you now. 
<laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I only do telehealth because I find it really, really works well because all of this that we're talking about, it's all talking. It's all education. So they can go to my website, just drmen.com, D-R-M-E-N-N.com, or follow me on Instagram, Dr. Men, O-B-G-Y-N. And I also see, so I see patients in my private telehealth practice, but I also see patients on the Alloy platform, um, which works really great for, um, at this point, it works really great for the kind of, I'd say the average un uncomplicated patient. I think for patients who are a breast cancer survivor, <clears throat> you know, I think that they need a longer, much more nuanced conversation. Um, yep. But, um, but certainly if you're a breast cancer survivor and you're just, you want to try to get access to just vaginal estrogen, um, Aloe is great for that. Um, or you can find me. And if I'm not licensed in your state, I'm licensed in like 20 something states. Um, I also do patient education only consults where I'll give you all the, the talking points and I'll give you, um, studies to print out and a, and a game plan on how to deal with your own oncologist or your own GYN. And what I find is most of the time, if a patient makes the time to make an appointment with a doctor separate from their regular follow-up visit, you've got to pay the doctor for their time that you, you know, this is how, you know, the business of medicine is right. That's, that's fine. Make a separate appointment. Say, I want to talk, have your lists there, come prepared, come, come empowered and educated and be prepared to move on. People have very like strong um, associations with their oncologists and they, they feel guilty when they move. But if it doesn't serve you anymore, it's okay to find somebody who will work with you if they're not working with you. Yeah. Or you just get a second opinion and then come back, right? And be like, yes, oh, they totally. said no too because they both think I'm too high risk or whatever. I'm like, great, collect yeah. the data. And, yeah. And, then you and in those cases, in the end, it's your decision making and it's your body and it's your choice. And to me, this is the this is a an extreme example of reproductive choice and reproductive health rights. Yeah, a hundred percent. This is what my podcast listeners and Instagram listeners have been waiting for. I'm so glad you came on to talk about breast cancer and hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy after breast cancer. And I I couldn't be more excited for this podcast episode to come out. Thank you so much for coming on today. Mm -hmm.